All set. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Hampstead School Board meeting on this Tuesday, uh, June 9th, 2020. Um, before we start, I'd like to read a statement regarding meetings during the state of emergency. Um, as chair of the Hampstead School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are A, providing access, excuse me, providing public access to the meeting by telephone. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen to this meeting by dialing the following phone number, 888-475-4400. Four four nine nine or eight seven seven eight five three five two five seven. B. We are providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom telephonetically. Instructions have also been for provided on the district website at HampsteadSchools.net. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please email hmstechnology at hampsteadschools.net. D, adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Keeping that in mind, Melissa, will you please call the roll call attendance? My fault, I'm stuck, hold on. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ms. Malcolm? Present, and I am alone in this house. Thank you, Mrs. Parnell. I am here, I am alone in the room. There are other members of my family in the house. Mr. Smith. Uh, present and I've got other members somewhere in the house. Mr. Sweeney. Present, other members in the house. Thank and you. is Mrs. Yasenka here? I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. I'll mark her as absent for now. Okay. Okay, all set. All right, thank you. Okay, the first item on our agenda, we're gonna go through approval of minutes. Uh, please note that you have a set of non-public minutes from our meeting on, sorry, I don't have the date in front of me. Hold on from May 26th, so we have a regular meeting set of minutes and a non-public set of meeting minutes. Please take a moment to review, and when you're ready, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes, please. Caitlin, excuse me, um, just so you know, uh, Karen Yasenka has just joined the meeting at 7.06, so Melissa will need that for her minutes. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. When anyone's ready, if we have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from the 26th. So moved. Second. 
Okay, Melissa, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. And Mrs. Yasenka? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion carries. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, next up, we have administrative reports and highlights tonight. Um, Mr. Collins, will you be going first? I guess so. My, my microphone just went on, so hi, folks. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Um, you have my printed report, and I'm just going to... Um, I'm just going to read for some of it and skip over some other parts here. But uh, to begin with, uh, the enrollments uh, really did not change, but we ended the school year just shy of 500 with 493 children. Um, that's a lot, the biggest number we've ever seen in recent years. Um, preschool and kindergarten enrollments for next year. Uh, there's a lot of parents that have been getting emails from me and there are more to come about what's going to happen with preschool and kindergarten this fall. A uh, couple of very important things that I just wanted to highlight here. Uh, kindergarten, as we plan through the budget, looks like we'll be able to do it with three full day kindergartens and two half day kindergartens. However, um, preschool is doing the same thing. I'll just go there as well. Our preschool numbers are actually gonna be down a little bit this fall, which is basically go down to some normalcy because having 50 kids in preschool right now is an enormous number. I've never seen that in many years. Um, the biggest challenge that we're having right now is we can't process all the, everybody all the way through. And one of those challenges that we're having is that we simply could not screen the children this spring as we typically do. We like to see every single child, whether they're in our preschool program or bring them in. And then the next piece too, and I've had a lot of conversations with Mr. Flynn and we've been keeping in touch with Dr. Metzler about COVID-19 and what that means to planning for the fall. So. We've made a deliberate decision to hold off on next steps on kindergarten registrations until we at least have a little bit more information to um, make commitments. Typically this time of the year, I'm sending parents a letter that says your child's gonna be in full day K or whatever and uh, asking for a deposit and getting some things processed through the summer. We're just gonna hold off on doing that. At the end of the month, I'm gonna reach back to the parents and let them know where we are. And in early August, we hope to screen the children, and I use the word hope. Um, and then at that point in time, we hope to get the uh, process rolling. If something else changes, um, we're just one, one part of a big picture. So I'll have to wait for the powers to be to sort of give us some guidance there. Uh, moving forward, classroom placements for next year. We typically tell the children on the last day of school, we didn't do that. However, there's a mailing that's gonna be going to all the central school families in a, a probably at the end of next week with the report cards and some other information. And part of that is I do hope to tell the families if they have a child in second, third or fourth grade next year, uh, who their homeroom teacher will be. We'll let the fifth grade, uh, the kids moving up to fifth grade know about who their advisor is. So when they start their advisory piece. Uh, next piece is remote learning. I could talk all day about how wonderful things have gone I've been trying to wrap up each of my staff meetings to just bring a few highlights to tell people some of the cool things that everybody else is doing. I shared with you with the board, as a board, the, uh, the 2020 community vid video. As many of you here know, the community event is a huge tradition at our school for second grade. And this year it all went virtual and you got a chance to see what it looks like and having the expertise of Christian Wisecarver was awesome. He's a dad here in town. Uh, it's actually his third child that's gone through second grade. He's, he's amazing what he did. He put it together. Um, he's got an enormous background in video. So what he did was way, way above all those little videos that the staff members have been doing with our dances. Um, the end of the year school parades were great. Um, one of the most fun times of the year I had was to see the fourth graders drive around the central school and then straight across the parking lot and then head over to the middle school to hang out with their new school. So Mrs. Denal and I actually shared the children for a day. If you'd like to see those videos, they're all over our YouTube channel. So they're there if you wanna see them. It was just wonderful to say goodbye to the children. And then the parade for the rest of our students, it seemed to go on forever 
and ever. And I never thought I could see so many families as I did at our previous parade in April, but this one just kept going and it was longer and longer. We had to have had at least 400 cars go through that parking lot. It was just a wonderful day. We had wonderful weather, a lot of sun on our bodies and big smiles. And the, one of the most adorable pieces to see the little ones hanging out through the windows with tears rolling down their face because they missed their teachers, they missed their friends. So it was a really endearing day. At the last meeting, Dr. Messler spoke very kindly of the work on uh, narrative report cards that are coming out from Central School. And um, I also appreciate the comments from the board members, uh, the support to the teachers, because they've taken on a monumental task. They've been working on it for a couple of weeks and hope to have it wrapped up by the end of this week. But basically, we just want you to give you an idea what that narrative is going to look like. If a child's in third or fourth grade, as an example, they're gonna get a narrative from their classroom teacher on three different sections, talking about the beginning of the semester from January up through March. Then they're gonna get a second narrative, what happened during remote learning. And then they're gonna get a third narrative talking about next steps in learning. They will also get an additional narrative or two or three, depending on their work uh, schedule and stuff like that, from a music teacher, an art teacher, a PE teacher, uh, ventures teacher, maybe a Title I teacher. So they'll be getting um, additional narrative. So it's going to be a multiple page document unique to every single child. So again, it is a monumental effort, but this is what the teachers felt was best to speak to the families about children and learning. Uh, the next thing I just wanted to say is I'm amazed at the dedication is shown by our teaching staff because they took this very serious and they wanted to make sure they could give you an effective report. Uh, they also wanted to make sure that they had the time to do it and we've been able to clear out some time and they've done a great job. I've been reading through a bunch of them as they're being put together. I'm really impressed. Uh, June, we've been really busy. The kids finished on the 29th but the teachers have not slowed down. The paraeducators have looked forward to get back into the building. I've been back at the school last week and again this week with many, many staff members. Uh, yes, just a few each day, just to honor all of those needs for social distancing. But if you walk through the school now, you'll see classrooms are taken down, things are off the walls. Uh, the custodial staff have already started to take it apart. Uh, the bags were packed. Hundreds of bags went out today uh, and yesterday because lots of families drove by. Uh, we actually have a few extra bags hanging around the schools and uh, Dr. Cheney was going to email all the families tonight to let them know that we'll, we're still going to be there the next couple of days if people need to pick them up and we'll reach out to the families about that work. But it was really sweet to see all the children as they drove through the parking lot. I snuck out in between my Zoom sessions and checking in with contractors and custodians and teachers and stuff. But yeah, it was, it was wonderful. It was a great day. Fortunately, we had great weather yesterday and again today. Um, our staff have been really busy, not only doing, you know, the cleaning up and putting those bags together and report cards, but we have many support staff members that are doing a fantastic job. As an example, uh, uh, Karen Gallagher um, hooked up a bunch of our teaching staff with some RBT training, which is registered behavior technician, which is high end training for the paraeducators that are going to support a child with things such as ABA, which is at Applied Behavioral Analysis Practices and some of those other high-end work that happens with our staff and the children. So they've been at the school this week packing up. Some of the teachers are still hanging around. Uh, can I come back for another day? Can I get some stuff packed up? So yes, we've been trying to work that, but uh, you know, I, I go to Zoom and I catch teachers at their homes just like tonight. It's just, it's wonderful that we can live in this world and environment. Uh, the, the last thing I want to say is next week, the teachers are actually going to meet to talk about curriculum, instruction, and assessment to say what happened this year, considering a third of our year was in remote learning. What's going to happen this fall as we open up a school year, knowing that this happened? And then um, they're also going to have a meeting to talk about each child. So they'll have a chance to sort of process. So the teacher that worked with the child this year, let's say they had Mrs. Gordon in second grade, Mrs. Gordon's going to meet with Ms. Kretschmer and say, this is what's going to happen with this child when they move up to you. So they can personalize it to learning. And the last thing I want to do is I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And I want to be very specific. I want to say thank yous for the fam to the families for our new partnership. We tried to provide and support learning in a remote world. Teachers, I want to say thank you for being so successful in a challenge that no one anticipated. We didn't learn about this in teacher school. 
or principal school. To our support staff, I wanna say thank you for supporting learning in a remote world, yet you still took care of our school building. I wanna say thank you to the Hampstead community for supporting the children when we couldn't be with each child each day. We like to make sure they have a, a nice lunch. We, we need to make sure the social, needs, social emotional needs are addressed, but the community of Hampstead was awesome. As an example, that food pantry was just great. Um, Eliza set up all those parades around town for children's birthdays. Those are things that we like to do for children. Uh, we wanna say thank you to the community of Hampstead for supporting the children. And I also wanna say thanks to, those, to the students for letting us adults learn something new. We certainly did learn something new, something that we're still trying to understand and digest and try to figure out what are we gonna do if something like this happens in our future. And um, we also wanna say thank you for the students for finding a new way to learn because many of them taught us about learning. Uh, kids have just found some really cool ways to do things. Many of them thrived, many of them struggled, but they found a way to learn. So it is our hope at the Central School that the children learned about resilience, kindness, and understanding during an unexpected challenge. And hopefully that carries them forth. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much, Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins. That was well said. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, seeing, hearing none, uh, we will move on to Mrs. Danola for the middle school. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good to see you. And I'd like to reiterate all the gratitude that Mr. Collins uh, spent with regards to our paraprofessionals, our students, our, our parents. Even today, I received you know, many conversations on the phone, on Zoom, and just, just checking in with parents to see how things are going. And um, for, the, for the most part, people are just so very thankful that we are such a hardworking um, district that just met this challenge with uh, the gusto that we always do. And um, it's, it's been a challenge, um, but we have learned quite a lot from our students during this time that I think will, will absolutely traject us to the next level of learning, whatever it looks like in September, October, or a year from now. Um, we have, of course, at the end of the year, there's so many uh, very special moments that we, we look forward to in graduation and uh, awards night. And so we worked extremely hard to make sure that our students were honored in, in the virtual way and also the, the personal way. So we created many opportunities uh, for kids to come through the building, uh, outside the building to see our staff um, and, and virtually. We celebrated our students by a challenge, our eighth grade students, especially with me in a minute. And this was a, a thought of, of, of giving our eighth graders of the last two weeks of school the ability to really reflect on who they are as a person when they graduate from Hampstead School District. Who were they when they came in, how they evolved, what their strengths were, what their, what their promise is for the future, and giving them an ability to share who they truly are without the, the um, constraints of, uh, of our school building. They were able to do this on, them, on their own with the guidance of their advisors. And we had a two hour presentation that was um, uh, via Zoom on Wednesday, May 27th. Uh, and each student created a, a one minute video of saying, me in a minute, and it was, over, it was powerful. It was extremely powerful because there were so many pieces of these students that we didn't know. We didn't know you were a horseback rider. We didn't know that you were an illustrator. We didn't know that you did um, all kinds of uh, video games that you were creating and, and, and creating all this coding. And given this, this ability in the uh, remote learning arena, the things uh, that, that students were able to flex their muscle given some time and, and more student choice um, really resulted in, in so many uh, different um, pieces of a child's uh, abilities that, that really came through. And we were just, it was very touching. And two hours of looking at our eighth graders, um, just letting us know who they were. It was, it was, it was wonderful. I've watched it twice and I've learned something each time from our, our eighth graders who 
you know, we, you, you, you do graduations and you say, this is such a wonderful class, but this class was so close and so tight and they celebrated each other so well throughout the four years that I've known them. Um, we, we, we just just love this class of 2020. So we also celebrate them with a, a parade on Friday the 29th. It was really hot, um, but the kids celebrated. The parents were there. Uh, our our whole staff came and just went throughout the whole perimeter of the the school building. They came. The police were there. We made noise. We had balloons, bubble makers, and. Um, um, I led the way with my car with my Hawks license plate and went really slow so everybody could make eye contact with their teachers and just give a nod. Um, it was it was it was full of like celebratory pieces, but we were also full of tears because we just we miss them so much. They're just such a great class. Um, and then after we we wiped our tears, then we had our baby hawks coming up from the the egress road and so here come our baby hawks and they were like baby hawks and they're they're so darn cute and so excited and they're on the campus and you know they're they've gone from huskies to hawks and it was um that just left us with such a a, a zest for life it was so wonderful to see that that new um that new class coming through our parade so it was a hot day, but it was it was pretty joyful. Uh, on June 4th, Thursday, we had our virtual graduation. Um, and I have to say, so many of these virtual video pieces, there were so many of them. I have to tell you, Mrs. Joseph, our assistant principal, was up till two in the morning. I can't even tell you. Just doing graduation took her about 80 hours to put the virtual graduation together. Now, we're not, uh, you know, uh, a, a, studio lot in, in Hollywood, we're trying our best to get every vignette of showing the kids in their lives and their sports and their music and their academics. And, um, it was, it was, uh, it was, I thought it came up pretty well. Um, and uh, the parents were there. We had, I think we had almost 200 people on the Zoom uh, to, to celebrate our kids. We had student speeches, we had musical, uh, presentations. Uh, Dr. Metzler, uh, he did uh, such a moving speech at the very beginning. Uh, he's he's really reached out to this class to 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 let them know that they are a special class and they are meeting special challenges that we appreciate, and um, they've done it with such grace and and dignity. Um, so uh, that was that was very special. Thank you, Dr. Metzler. And we then had our National Junior Honor Society induction ceremony as well the day before for our seventh graders. We had 26 seventh graders that were inducted into the, um, the council that was uh, focused on the four pillars of everyday scholarship, service, leadership, character, and citizenship. Um, and that went very well. Congratulations to Mrs. Howard for uh, spearheading that. Uh, our, our teachers are currently, they are in their classrooms. We have had eighth graders picked up their belongings yesterday, seventh graders today, sixth graders tomorrow, fifth graders on Thursday, and they're turning in their, their, um, their belongings. We've got uh, returning medications, we're getting musical instruments, and we've got 400 different students' bags collected from all areas of the school. So. Um, it's going very well, um, but those that haven't been picked up, we will figure out how to get those belongings to the parents and, uh, and move forward. Um, we created a virtual track program um, to instill the, the need for physical activity and Mrs. Muskrat and Mrs. Rubin developed a virtual track program for staff and, and students and we have 35 people participating in that. Uh, and along with that, they get a $10 gift card if they are participating and getting out there and working out. Um, we also were, we um, joined with Moo's Place, an ice cream place in uh, Derry and Salem, who they uh, supported the importance of reading with our, uh, our reading specialist, doc, uh, sorry, Mrs. Connors. And they read books, they put in their 
what they've read and they um, can win a raffle for some ice cream treats. So encouraging summer reading. Uh, we also did virtual Hawk Awards for quarter four, um, focusing on respect, responsibility, and relationships. And our students were honored. And we did it this we, we did it with a surprise by contacting the parents individually, letting them know to, to, to show up for this Zoom. And the kids were surprised, and the teachers all made speeches for every single individual child. Um, we on Sunday there was a Pinkerton graduation parade. Uh, that went through the town of Hampstead to celebrate our Astros that were celebrating uh, their 2020 graduation. Uh, on this Friday, report cards will be mailed home. And I'm sure there's many other things, but we've, even though the kids finished their, their schooling on the 29th, we're still really busy. And our, our staff, we're ready for uh, professional development starting on Friday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday is their last day of, of, uh, of work. So they are, they're putting in the hours. They, they know they're, they're there till June 18th and uh, they're doing so with, with as much gusto as a hot can. I'm sure I'm missing something, but it's, it's been really busy. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I did watch the eighth grade graduation and I have to commend all of you, especially Mrs. Joseph for the time she put in, but I felt it was in these circumstances, a really impressive way to send off this class. So kudos to all of you for putting it together and to that class for getting through this and finding ways to still connect. So, so thank you, Mrs. Danola. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we move on? Okay, seeing, hearing none. Um, Dr. Metzler, do we have any other administrative reports? I didn't know it. I know I see Mrs. Gallagher's here. I wasn't sure if she was presenting tonight or not. Yeah, Karen, um, I wasn't sure if, if she was, I know she has an exec, you know, executive summary in the, in the packet. I didn't know if she right. had something she wanted to present. Uh, Karen? Not to put you on the spot, Mrs. Gallagher, you can. <laughs> It's okay, but we just I, we wanted to check. I think she was good for tonight. Oh wait, there she is. Hi. Oh, okay. oh she's muted. Hold on. Oh, that's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> there we go, Karen. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I didn't know if you had any specific questions or um, if you just wanted me to give you an update regarding the governor's emergency order. Yeah, a general update would be great because I've, I've heard a little bit about it and sure. I've heard from some people, not actual educational people, let's be clear there, but right. um, with concerns about not being able to do what he's asking and everything like that. So just, I mean, as far as give us a general, um, summary of what we're looking at and if you have any concerns about us about Hampstead being able to do what we need to do. Okay all right so the first part of his order is for all um, students with IEPs for meetings to be held to discuss ESY recommendations whether um, the team feels that it's necessary or not. So for those that have already had um, IEP meetings kind of maybe like the first half of the year before the school closure, um, the recommendation was to have a second meeting um, because things may have changed due to the online learning. So that's required, you know, second meetings for many of the students. Um, and for those where ESY was not recommended initially during the first part of the school year, um, we are required to meet again and see if that decision has changed as a result of the remote learning. And in some cases that has, and in some cases it hasn't because online has been um, productive for some students, but for others, not so much. So it's kind of a, a mixed uh, bag there. Um, but we are getting through the meetings. All administrators are helping out with that, you know, being the LEA. So um, I don't have concerns there. I think we're in fairly good shape being a smaller district. Um, so, that's the first order um, that he had put forth. Um, let's see. And the second one isn't going to really happen until 
um, school is back in session and whether it's remote or in person, we need to have meetings for all of our students with IEPs to determine whether or not compensatory, compensatory services are necessary. Um, and in order to make that determination, um, the case managers are really gonna wanna work with those students, even informally with some type of an assessment to see if they're kind of where they expected them to be or if they've you know, lost a lot of ground as a result of you know, all the unexpected changes of, of remote learning. Um, so those will be a lot of meetings. Um, they're supposed to happen within 30 days um, from the first day of school. So that's a lot. That one is a little more concerning. That's a tremendous amount of meetings. Um, and then the third item uh, in the governor's emergency order just has to do with evaluations um, and stating that there is no um, relaxation of timelines as a result of um, school closures. We're still bound to meet all the regulations and the timelines. Um, and you know, every district is struggling with that because we can't do face-to-face -face assessments. So we are really having to wait until school reopens where we can do that. Um, and the order also says, you know, if there's any way you can use information that you have, um, you know, to, to do that. So we're, we're hoping, you know, that once school is open or that, you know, um, we're allowed to work with students, um, we can do those assessments and, and, you know, follow through with the referral process. Okay. Thank you. You're Caitlin, if I, if I could, while, yeah. we have Karen, while we have Karen, don't mute Karen. Um, you know, I promised you uh, meeting after meeting after meeting an update on the IDEA money that was uh, oh. missed. And uh, Karen has done an incredible job um, chasing that down and getting it, getting it back in, into Hampstead's hands. So uh, while she's on, I'd, I'd really like for her to, to really tell you uh, where we are with that. And it's really good news for Hampstead. And thank you, uh, Karen, for your hard work with us. All right, you're welcome. Yeah, it is exciting. So we are going to receive the funds that were sent to Derry um, because we're being told that those funds are going to follow our students. And because they're at Pinkerton and that's where the location is, um, Derry has the money, but Derry is going to work with us in the other sending districts. So we have about $61,000 um, in their hands, and we are going to put that toward tuition of one of the special ed programs. Um, so it's one activity and it'll be done. I've already sent it. Um, and there's, um, you know, a memorandum of understanding between Dr. Metzler and the superintendent of Derry. So that's a piece that was also required. So we should be good with that. Thank you. You're welcome. I know that was <laughs> a long time and a lot yes. of work. They've done a lot of work with the other districts to make that work. Right. So thank you. Right. You're welcome. Ms. Gallagher, can you remind us how much that amount was? Approximately 61,000. Thank you. That was great. Sure. Okay. Any other questions for Mrs. Gallagher tonight? No? Okay. Okay. Thank right. you. Thanks. Okay. I think that's it for administrative reports tonight. Um, so we're going to move on to our current business part of the agenda. First up, we have um, Beth Metzler here to talk about, to give us a, an end of year update on the FLESS program. Um, just a reminder for not so much board members maybe, but other people who are watching. This was our first year um, of foreign language in elementary school. Um, so we're gonna find out how it went. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now here. Thank you. Okay, so hello. Um, hello. For those of you, <laughs> hello. Uh, for those of you that are new or don't know me, I'm Beth Metzler, and I'm a FLESS consultant working with the Hampstead School District to implement FLESS or foreign language in the elementary school. I've been asked to give an update on our first year of the FLESS program at the Hampstead Central School. FLESS was very successful this year. We had an extremely successful first year. 
and implementation of the FLESS program in kindergarten. Um, the FLESS model that was implemented in the Hampstead School District this year developed students' language proficiency by a content-connected and standard-based program. Um, it used an interdisciplinary approach to deliver both the language and content-rich instruction through communication. The students showed that they were not only able to learn the language, but they were also highly engaged in learning content through the language. The students were provided a stimulating and flexible agenda in which they actively participated throughout the class periods. Um, on us to, to, on this uh, Zoom meeting tonight is Mrs. Elizabeth Kane. Um, our new FLESS teacher, Elizabeth, Ms. Elizabeth Kane, Izzy, did a wonderful job of transitioning into the kindergarten classrooms this year. The students were always enthusiastic, ready, and eager to learn Spanish. And actually, when I would observe, they were very sad when Mrs. Kane had to end the class and move on to another classroom. Um, some of the FLESS methodology ap approaches and characteristics that were used in the FLESS classroom this year and that we will continue to be used in our program as we go along and develop the program will be um, words and expressions will be taught in context and not isolation. We use a, um, a wide range of instructional materials to express meaning through visuals, gestures, manipulatives, mime, and context, and not through translation. Um, the students received continual positive reinforcement from Mrs. Kane. The student's environment was low stress and correction of student error, and a lot was through modeling and by example. Um, there was a lot of meaningful 21st century learning was done through, the situa through situationalized activities such as conversations, small group work, role playing, learning games, songs, poems, stories. Um, lots of short questions and comments about everyday activities. They had in-class recognition of birthdays, achievements, and other events that are um, important to students. There was a systematic review and re-entry of reinforcements of previously taught, for taught material. Um, there was a lot of content-based instruction, as I said earlier, reinforcing the core knowledge taught in the students' academic areas. And uh, with this program, there is always a, a tremendous amount of TPR, which is total physical response in all aspects of learning. Um, we did informal assessments um, in three modes, interpersonal, presentational, and interpretive. So in short, the students in the FLESS program this year were in, in an extremely encouraging learning environment in which the language directly related to them, their surroundings reflecting their needs, interests, and everyday life. So now I'm going to let Mrs. Kane speak to some of her specific classroom routines and lessons. Uh, Izzy, you there? Yeah. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So hi, uh, the kids know me as Senora Kane, but my name is Izzy. Um, and this was my first year teaching FLESS. I had been the um, ESOL consultant for the district and just happened to be a Spanish speaker with young kids and knew that the kids could do it and that, it, that they would do well. I just don't think I could have been ready for how well they did and how quickly they jumped into it. They were amazing. The kindergarten team was incredibly friendly and welcoming. So there was a lot of just, you know, consistent um, working with them and making sure that what I was doing wasn't asking too much for the kids or if the timing of things would could be, you know, more catered to where classes were at a particular time and make things easier for kids and more supportive for what they were learning. So what you're looking at is um, our daily agenda. We would always start off with the greeting. So Buenos Dias means good morning, but we start off with a song. Um, we would go through and count the calendars. So we would talk about days of the week, months of the year, and numbers. We would actually do physical things while counting. Um, and they had gotten up to 30 by the time remote learning had started. We would then move on, the orange section is our, our, our dialogos, or our conversation that we would have for the day. And it started out much shorter. Um, and with me doing most of the modeling and I have a little frog puppet that would show them how, but by the end of the year, they could talk to one another and they were switching partnerships each day, introducing themselves, giving a greeting, and then saying how old they were. And that was only in March. Um, the next section, we would do lots of different songs and poems. Most of them had movement um, to help reinforce number, shape, color, clothing, you know, seasonal words, talking about wind, um, turkeys at Thanksgiving, things like that. Um, the green strip is our activity. So there's always some kind of a game. It's usually to introduce the new topic that we're working on or to help them to continue to practice it. Um, and, you know, we're only spending about 10 minutes, you know, all told on the actual activity. 
so I'm able to then work individually with kids and hear them speak and then speak to them as well in that, in that section um, with new content. And then the blue strip, we also sing a song for Dios Amigos, so a really clear template for the kids to follow. Um, you know, some kids were in class all the time and some kids were being, um, their schedule got changed around for um, interventions and things like that. And knowing what the schedule was going to be and knowing that they were going to be able to start and end class was something that they were familiar with, um, helped them out a lot. And I think, I mean, honestly, I was so impressed and, you know, just tremendously pleased with how well they did. Um, I was really excited about coming back into first grade thinking, wow, you know, when are we going to be able to start with that um, right around the time that remote learning started? So they, they did a really good job staying positive and trying their best and doing as much as they could during the remote learning um, period. But, I, you know, it's just tough because there really isn't in, in a flex component, there really isn't a substitute for being able to hear the word person, like in person and being able to like interact and do it, particularly at this age where there's so little and so much of what we do is sing and play and move. Um, but again, they did their best and they did a great job. The families were super supportive. Um, and I just, even with all of this, um, oh, so this is an example of what our dialogue looks like. So <laughs> there's my puppet frog, Ramona. Um, and she and I started having the conversation together. The kids know that the green dialogue is Ramona, so they say the Ramona part, and then mine is in blue, and I, I speak that back to them. So first they're just listening, and then eventually they take on different parts of it. Um, and when we ended, they had actually, this, this is, you know, good morning, how are you? I'm good, how are you? And then asking and telling their names, but they had already gotten past that to ask how old are you are, like how old are you, and then being able to respond, I am five or I am six, which is you know, the number that corresponded to most of their ages. Um, so yeah, I, I feel really good about being able to start off pretty close to where we left off in the fall um, as, as their new first grade classrooms begin. And, you know, having worked with a kindergarten team already and having spoken a lot with the first grade team in preparation for this all, I think we're in a really good place. I, everybody's been great and the kids are wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what we have discussed or what I have discussed with um, Tara Lynn is we're going to normally the first year or each unrolling year is a working document and a working curriculum. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue to have kindergarten be working in the spring again next year. Um, there is always a lot of recycle and review at the beginning of each year um, for the summer brain, um, but we will do a lot of recycle and review again in the beginning of the year. Um, and we'll be absolutely be ready um, and the kids will be right where they're supposed to be um, in the fall. So um, we have had a, a tremendous amount of positive feedback too um, from the community um, and the parents this year. I've been sent pictures, videos, uh, emails. Um, uh, students have been uh, pictures of students carrying their learning home and singing songs, reciting poems. And um, some common frequently asked question that I have had is how can I help my child with the language? So we have put on um, the webpage a few ideas of how these parents can take a little initiative at home as well about talking to their child, what he or she is learning in class. Um, look over some of the work that the child is bringing home, have them count, sing. They are going home and getting off the bus and counting and singing, doing this anyway. Um, I, again, I've seen a lot of pictures and videos and um, have the children teach the family what they're learning. But Izzy, Mrs. Kane, also has FLESS units of study on her FLESS teacher website for parents to see, um, where there are essential teaching points by units and by month. So that's very helpful as well. Um, and also on our Plus webpage, I, we have listed um, some apps and some Spanish learning activities and games there. They can also go on at home as well to take some initiative again of their learning at home. Some of, for more information on our FLESS program, you can please see um, the 2020-2021 FLESS brochure on the Hampstead Central School webpage. Um, again, Mrs. Kane's FLESS teacher website. And again, some useful links that we have put up for uh, reference and more research on the benefits of learning a second language at an early age. 
again, a list of useful apps that you will see as you go um, for students to use at home and practice vocabulary songs, numbers, even math games. So um, this is an extremely exciting time um, and a wonderful opportunity for our Hampstead community and students. And I really look forward to continuing to work with the Hampstead School District and Central School staff for a successful full K-4 plus implementation. Um, now we're on to grade one. Um, Tara Lynn or Dillard, would you like to give your thoughts, uh, input on FLESS this year? Oh, sure. Hi. Um, I, I have to agree wholeheartedly with Mrs. Metzler and Mrs. Kane. Year one of the FLESS program has been an incredible success. Um, the lessons matched our kindergarten programming very well. Students were reading books that they know and love in English, such as Brown Bear, Brown Bear, and reading them in Spanish, which um, not only reinforced color concepts, but was complemented our literacy program very well. Um, everything was incredibly engaging and interactive. And one of my favorite things when we were in the building was that kindergartners would walk down the hall and say, hola. Um, and that was about as much as I could do of the conversation, but uh, they could keep going if, if I had had the skills. Uh, but it was a great addition to our kindergarten program and I'm really looking forward to next year and seeing how it continues to develop. I also, if I can interrupt again for a minute, I have to give kudos to the kindergarten teachers, um, to Tara Lynn, to Dillard. Um, they've all been amazing and so extremely helpful and supportive. Um, kindergarten teachers were so welcoming um, us in this program into their classrooms. Um, it's just been truly an entire effort here um, and it's been a wonderful year. I just wanna say, uh, jump in and say thank you to Beth. You've done a great job sort of mentoring us through here. I think the real key to making this program work is that the teachers really stepped it up. We gave them a lot of tools. Um, we gave them an enormous toolbox, uh, but our kindergarten team embraced this in a huge way. In fact, they embraced Izzy so much that I thought by the end of the year, I might as well just put her in a kindergarten room next year because, well, first of all, she's got an enormous background as an educator. So we're blessed to have a person in our staff with all of her talents and skills and to use her language, which is so important to her, is wonderful and, and it really showed in the children. I also think it's important to say, um, when I asked Beth some questions about uh, some of the details of this, she knew when her uh, pieces were she would take over and one of the ones she said to me, I don't know how to do a schedule for an elementary school. So I just want to say thank you to the principals that she pointed to me, uh, that pointed out that gave us some ideas on how they were doing it. Um, we basically ended up, the children ended up seeing Izzy either two or three times a week. Uh, we made specific accommodations for scheduling for some children, but pretty much every child got to spend two or three times a week with uh, Senior Kane. But the piece that you don't also know is that I'd walk into the classroom on the day she's not there and that lesson continued, which is one of the, the great pieces of this. Next year in grade one, when these children move forward, they'll, they'll see Senior Kane three times a week uh, and we'll continue with that model of two or three times a week in our kindergarten. So thank you board for uh, putting into the budget that we see a lot more of Senora Kane this fall. Yeah. Muchas, muchas gracias. <laughs> so Kaylin, anything like else? Like yeah, uh, doctor, I think Dr. Metzler, yes, go ahead. Well, I think I think one of the important things, and this is this is really where the the you know, town of Hampstead School Board really should be commended, you know. And, and Maria Danola, Principal Danola, mentioned this earlier. You know, our, our mean a minute. So you know, what what experience do our kids have as they go through, you know, from preschool right up through grade eight? And when you watch those and you watch what kids celebrate and the programs that you put in, you know, some places call them allied arts, some places call them specialists, whatever. But um, the support for you know, all those other programs, this program and certainly all of our other programs really help. Um, it just really gives a well-rounded education to all of our, our students here in Hampstead. And we're, we're super appreciative. And I think um, you've continued to build on that. Um, you give them safe, clean, healthy uh, places to, to work and, and thrive in. And um, so, so thanks for that. But I, I think I just want to say again, just take a look at that me in a minute. It's really incredible to listen to our eighth graders as they leave what was important to them. Um, it makes it crystal clear what it makes it crystal clear what we should be doing. It also supports what we are doing. So thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I know as a board, when we decided to implement this um, and move it forward, I think we were, we were very excited about it. It, it to me, seemed like a no-brainer. Um, to we, we strive in this district to prepare all of our students as well as we can um, for a 21st century and beyond education. And this was absolutely the next logical step. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear how well it's going and how well it's being um, integrated into the community for elementary school. So thank you all for getting it worked out and, <laughs> and getting it all implemented. And, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll be excited um, to hear more updates the end of next year, um, next school year, whatever that looks like. Uh, but any other board members have comments or questions on um, this year for FLESS? Yeah, Caitlin, um, I would just like to echo what you said. Um, I'm just very pleased that our board, you know, voted unanimously to support FLESS and to move it forward um, at a time when there, there were some questions. Um, you know, I remember that. There were some questions. Well, is this the right time to do it? You know, we're going to have the resources. So, you know, I just want to say that I'm very proud that our board made that decision. And we made that decision for our students. And I want to give a special uh, thank you to um, Beth Metzler for her leadership in this area. And overall, just say, um, you know, with the introduction of FLESS, I see it as another example of um, the value that we, Hampstead, as a community, places on providing our students with um, varied learning and new experiences. So I just want to thank everyone um, from the board, uh, administrator, staff, consultant, and the students and parents for embracing this, because I think it's something that's really important for our kids to have. Thanks. Absolutely. I had uh, one question. Um, so as this rolls out to first grade, second, third, and fourth, at what point do you feel we need to add a second teacher? I'm sure you won't be able to handle K to yeah. four, but at what, like when it rolls to second grade, will we need a second teacher, third grade? Uh, can I just speak to, I'll, I'll speak to that real briefly. Uh, I know when we developed the budget this year, I did an analysis of how much time we would need to provide for this teacher. I'm going to take a conservative guess that we probably need to take that position full time next year and we may not be able to meet all of the needs so it all depends on if we can maintain the same structure that's there uh, and i think uh, the advice that we're getting from uh, mrs metzler will be critical to that but i know we've created a schedule this fall so she's doing uh, k and one and as we move forward up into second grade um, we'll start stretching the limits i would guess the position will grow one year and then we'll probably look at a second individual the year afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I guess my other question, I don't know if it's a question, but so this is elementary school and then we have middle school. Um, I'm just curious to see how this initial class is when they, when they leave eighth grade versus the current eighth grade class. So if I can- for them. If I can just speak to that, I know that I have, I have a student in kindergarten whose sister just started in the fifth grade this year. So they just started, the, her, the older sibling is in the middle school and is now getting their first year of instruction. And when the kindergartner would come home and practice their dialogue, the fifth grade, the, the mom would let me know that the fifth grader was getting upset because they're like, you're in kindergarten. Why are you speaking the same? Like, how, why do you know as much Spanish as I do? So, I, I mean, you know, I don't want to speak to everybody at that point, but I feel like they're going to have an extra four years of of practice of vocabulary of building and i think they'll be able to get into a lot more like you know headier i think that the, the middle school is going to have to adjust their curriculum on and not not to you know not saying for because i'm this amazing teacher but just because the kids will have all this exposure and they'll be ready for a lot more when they really get by the time they get to the middle school right, right. Think about that, that the middle school you know, in a few years having to adjust their fifth grade curriculum because all the kids will have it. So uh, I can speak to that. I'm actually I've already been in contact with the middle school, te middle school Spanish teachers. Um, I've talked to Mrs. Randall and Mrs. Nesto. Um, they're 
in the process of getting to the point where they're going to, they've, they've seen the kindergarten curriculum and they're even working with me to start working with their curriculum, but also um, they want to, they're going to start coming to observe the classes, to come and see Izzy, to see how this development is ongoing. Um, so, so they're, they're getting prepared, they're getting ready and they know um, that they will need to um, have a, more for these kids when they get there. Um, by the time the kids graduate, as you were asking for eighth grade, by the time the kids graduate eighth grade, they will be entering, um, for the kids that stick with us, they will be entering into a third, a, a level three high school Spanish class. Yep. So, so Caitlin, if I could? Yep. Yeah, so how we've seen this, um, this, this playing out, obviously, in another district as well, and in other districts that, uh, that that FLUS has been implemented in, you know, our, our gives our kids a, a real competitive advantage um, as they go to high school, as, as, um, as Beth just mentioned, you know, they'll go into higher level Spanish. Um, for many of them, they'll pick up a, a third language. And, and um, you know, we've seen some students have three, three languages and then even take Latin. So I think from a, uh, from, you know, what their resume will look like, what their transcripts will look like, it'll make our students when they graduate from Pinkerton, extremely competitive um, internationally when they apply to schools and, and their resumes and, and like I said, transcripts will be, will be that much more solid and it'll make them, it'll just give them a competitive advantage. So we're really excited about it. I mean, uh, aside from the cultural benefits to this and certainly uh, the ability to speak two or maybe three languages, uh, I, I do think that our, our students, our children will, um, will have a, a great advantage when they get to Pinkerton Academy. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mansour. I would have to agree, and I think that was one of the things that when we were initially looking into implementing a FLESS program, I mean, there's so much, I, I remember this being talked about, I believe, is that there, there's so much benefit to the development of a, especially a young child's mind when they are learning a new language and how that impacts everything else. Just like we talk about music helping brain development and everything else, have it being bilingual and um, I, it's, it'll be very exciting to see how this how this plays out over the years. So, yeah, to to Jim's, to Jim's question too, what you know, one of the things that we've noticed uh, in other districts, when we had a really really solid FLES program, we started to realize, and this is not true in Hampstead, Mrs. Randall and Mrs. Nesso did a great job, but that our our middle school curriculum was was not as rigorous as our our FLES curriculum, and you know, major adjustments had to be made well in advance of students actually making it through the middle school after going through the FLESS program. So, you know, that's true in Massachusetts. It's been true here in New Hampshire. So we're, we're way ahead of that. We, you know, we've been working with Pinkerton and certainly our, our consultant has been working with our middle school teachers well in advance because we know, we know what we need to prepare for. Uh, we're not going to try to build that, that airplane when it's in, this, in the sky. We already know what needs to be done two years out, three years out, five years out, seven years out. So, um, you know, that preparation and planning and execution is all underway. Yeah, uh, one more thing, sorry. Um, not that I want to uh, run before we walk, but I was just thinking, you know, because Hampstead is so different, I think, um, is there an opportunity to offer another language in addition to Spanish? Um, I don't know. Well, those will be discussions that we can have, you know, down the road. Um, one of the things in terms of we don't, we never want to um, make ourselves mediocre in what we do. So we don't want to suffer from initiative fatigue. So we want to make sure that we do all the things to implement correctly. And then uh, if that opportunity arises or that, that opportunity to have that discussion takes place, it's certainly um, something we can talk about. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, okay, any, <laughs> thank you. Um, any additional questions for around FLESS? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, um, Mrs. Kane and Mrs. Metzler. This was this was great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Next up, we need to talk about suspension authorization. Um, so this is something we do annually, and this is for the board to give authorization to superintendent for our superintendent and an assistant superintendent when we have one. Um, to suspend students beyond 10 days um, per RSA 193 colon 13. Um, 
I have a motion I can put forward. Dr. Metzler, is there anything you need, you would want to speak to um, around this before we put the motion forward? I mean, to me, this is relatively straightforward. Um, this is what we've been lining up our policies to do and in general, but is there anything you would want to speak to about this? No, I just think it's, it's an important uh, piece to, to managing student behavior and managing climate. And so we appreciate uh, you know, being able to, to manage this through this, you know, giving us the opportunity to spend. It very rarely happens, um, but it is an opportunity to have those discussions when, when students engage in behavior that's um, dangerous or at risk or puts people's safety at risk that we have uh, another layer of suspension beyond what the principal would, would offer. So this would be, you know, the principal could suspend up to 10 days. This would be beyond the 10 days. Um, all the appeal process and everything happens at the building level unless it was serious enough where it had to be beyond 10 days. So that's that's really what you're doing is authorizing me to manage uh, those suspensions that would go beyond the 10 day window. Okay, so I have um, kind of some wording here. We can bring forward a motion and then we can discuss if need be. Um, but the I'd be looking for a motion to authorize the superintendent and his designee to continue the suspension of a student for a period in excess of 10 school days as provided for in RSA 193 colon 13B. I'll move. You have a second. I'll we second. need a second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any discussion or questions around this? Yes, Caitlin. I have a question only because we're going to be moving forward um, after the withdrawal. And I just, we had said at some point that we needed to take a look at our policies because all of our policies some you know may change being a single district single school district so even in here i'm not sure is the heading going to stay the same superintendent and assistant superintendent well the wording for that, this with that if the assistant superintendent needs to be taken out i know the wording in the motion does not mention it but is the assistant superintendent term still in the policy as a heading that's all I'm saying. I just yeah, want to be no. careful that something that we don't have. <laughs> Caitlin, if I could. Yes. Well. Sure. So my intention would be to um, to scrub all of our policies that would be central office policies, and um, and to take a take a really good long look at, at all the language, like you know Mrs. Yusink is talking about, and uh, we'll we'll be able to create our own Hampstead set of um, policies that are central office policies uh, moving forward. I mean that's scheduled for July 1, 2021. That's part of our plan. That's part of the things that we need to do to get ready for that that separation. And uh, we're, we're looking at those policies now. I can tell you that our current policies line up with this. You know, the question would be, what would happen if you didn't authorize the superintendent to do this? That would mean the board would have to have re-entry hearings or hearings every time a 10-day suspension happened. So, you know, what warrants a 10-day suspension? You know, assaults, drugs, weapons, things of that nature when the police are involved, um, things that are tremendously disruptive to either one of our schools. Do we have a lot of them? No, of course we do not have a lot of them, but occasionally we do have um, misbehaviors that need to be addressed with serious consequences. Uh, we work closely with families and outside agencies, um, not to go too far down that road in, in this conversation, but that would be the, you know, it that would be at the board level. So, um, you know, we, we, we manage that, uh, you know, obviously at the central office, but um, the, long th the long story short here is, uh, those policies will all get scrubbed and they will be just for Hampstead only central office uh, as soon as that separation happens. Um, if it happens sooner than July 1, 2021, so be it. If not, um, but we'll be ready to make that break. Hey, thank uh, you. I do have a question though. Um, so in the motion, can, would, you, uh, would it be okay to say, but notification by the superintendent of what those are, what that uh, suspension is? Notification to who? Cool. To, um, I'm just going to answer for myself because I don't know the the answer about whether. Uh, generally, we as a school, like the school board, does not get involved in disciplinary. And here's one, here's one reason that I would need to say either we need to table this, and come back, which I'd rather not do. But because we're essentially an appeal body. Yep. 
we need to have as little information as possible prior to an appeal that may happen. So I guess, I guess, we, are, are you asking to amend it to just let the board know when there is a suspension Correct. that goes Correct. beyond 10 days? Correct. Okay. Caitlin, I, I think if I can speak, um, yeah. I don't believe that that would be inappropriate. I mean, I obviously would leave the student's name out. I mean, this, you know, yeah. communications with the board has been pretty much keeping all five of you um, yeah. up to date yeah. in terms of anything that happened. We typically wouldn't mention the student name, but we would let you know. And I, and I do that with our students that are at Pinkerton as well and make sure our board knows that, you know, our 400 plus students that are at Pinkerton, if, if things happen to them there, I would, I would bring that to you as well. So you can tell that we haven't had a lot because we don't have a lot, but when we do, mm -hmm. we, we share those serious um, infractions with you. Okay. I mean, I think that, I think that's fine, but uh, let's, so we don't do this often, so we need to amend the motion. <laughs> And honestly, we just don't do this that often. So I, I never remember what the, um, so Melissa, what do we need to do? Does, should David, do we need to take it off the floor and then? Okay, I, I don't believe that. I'm what, sorry. I don't believe Dave's request is associated with the motion. Um, he may, I, I'm not sure. Like my communication with you would, would continue to be what it is. I mean, you know, if, I don't know if that needs to be in the motion. The motion primarily is to allow me to manage the suspensions beyond 10 days. Right. If the condition is, and notify the board when a suspension beyond 10 days is given, that's fine. I would do that anyway. But if you need to put that in there, that's, you know, that, that, that I think would connect the motion oh. with the action of communication. Okay. I'd so, like to just, just yeah, it's the way Karen. it is. I would like to just leave it the way it is and let Dr. Metzler take care of all the disciplinary actions. And as you said, um, the, the less we know, the better off we are because we are an appellate board. I mean, could we could just kind of state as a directive, again, I would agree, Dr. Metzler, you always let us know when something serious has happened in a general sense. Um, I don't know, David, are you, does that satisfy what, if we don't change the motion, but we put it as a statement, yep. a directive that he, that the superintendent notifies us when this happens? That's fine. I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost wondering why we don't make this just part of our policy, with or without what I was asking, but just in general, because it seems like every year we vote on this, that we just make this part of our policy instead of having a vote every year, but so. Why do we vote? Do we vote on it every year because of the RSA? Is that the the RSA drives you? you this is an annual thing that you have to. Okay, so we have to re up it every year, basically. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. I was just looking at the RSA. I didn't see anything that says we have to re up it every year. I just saw that it says school board or representative designated in writing by the school board. Okay. So, just a just a statement that if. I'd be good with putting all this into policy, you know, even without what I was asking for addition, but just mm -hmm. in general, I mean, this is part of our policy. But if, okay. if we're being told we have to do this every year, I just didn't see it in the RSA. Okay. Well, I'm gonna. We have the policy. So we we realize we have policy work to do, and yeah. we'll we'll get rocking on that. Um, in the meantime, this is really the authorization to take care of business. Okay, so knowing we, we're going to look at our policies, um, following what we've done, so we'll do the author, I would say we take the vote on the authorization. And like you said, David, if we can, if there, if it, if we look at it and it can be done just via policy, depending on whatever the RSA says, then, then we're good for next year. Okay, uh, Melissa, will you please call a roll call vote on the motion? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up is our summer hiring authorization. So basically, we do this every year um, so that if the 
administrators need to hire anyone over the summer. We don't have to call a board meeting or a special meeting to approve those hires. Um, Jim, I think this was you last year, if I recall. So if basically if anyone is hired, um, Jim can give the authorization for that. He would then give us an update when we meet again at the end of the summer or beginning of September, whenever it is. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to put your hand up to do this. I would imagine it's all online at this point this year. Um, Jim, I don't know if you had to go in and sign anything last year, but um, last summer. I don't recall. It was that exciting. So okay. on that note, I will volunteer to do it again. Okay. Unless anyone wants to fight about it, I would be looking for a motion that we, the motion to designate Jim Sweeney as the board member who is authorized to act on personnel matters while, while the board is not in session over the summer months. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Melissa, will you please call a roll call vote? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Okay, thank you. Moving along, next up we have federal funding authorization. So again, this is something we do each year. And this is authorizing our superintendent, assistant superintendent, um, our BA and our assistant BA to apply for and receive on behalf of the Hampstead School District federal and state grants um, and funding. Um, I'd like to go forward with a motion and then we can discuss and if there's anything um, that Mr. Dowd or Dr. Metzler wanna add. Um, they can, but I would be looking for a motion to authorize Dr. Metzler, Jeff Dowd, Maria Watkins, and the assistant superintendent, should we have one, to apply for and receive on behalf of the district federal and state grants and funding, which will include approving and signing OBM Form 1s, Form 3s, and Form 4s, and to file such authorization with the New Hampshire Department of Education. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion or questions or Dr. Metzler or Mr. Dowd, if you have any um, comments or info you'd like to give us around this? I do, I do not. I don't know if uh, Jeff has anything he'd like to add. I do not. Okay. Does anyone have questions on the board? Okay. Seeing and hearing none. Melissa, will you please call the roll? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, next up we have tuition rates. Mr. Dowd, you're going to be speaking to this. Yes, yeah, so I believe you have a memorandum. Um, from my office relative to proposed tuition rates for 2020 to 2021. The tuition rates are uh, for families or entities who would like to tuition their students into our district from, uh, who do not live in town. So these are for non, this is sort of the non-resident tuition rate. This comes up in a, in a, a, a number of different scenarios, including if a, a child is placed from another district in our district, and, and there are just a number of situations that this can come up. So the, the rates that you see are derived by taking a look at the actual cost per student in our district and projecting forward the budget increases each year, taking into consideration our, our fluctuations in um, enrollments during those times. Um, kindergarten is uh, 10,098, approximately half of the elementary rate, which is proposed at 20,196. Middle school, 20,448 and special education is 40,643. You'll note that the special education rate um, covers um, your basic general special education services, but does not uh, include specialized services, specialized transportation, one-to-one uh, -one assistance. So I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions you have. There are also some historic rates there 
at the bottom of the page which show the trending of where our rates have been in the past. I'm sorry, Jeff, can you give me the middle school rate again? I'm having trouble finding it in all my... Yes, it's uh, 20,448. I can share the document. Oh, even better. Thank you. Yep, give me a moment. Just a second, let me pull it up here for you. Yep, no problem. All right. Any other questions on the rates while I'm pulling this up? No? Apparently, I'm, I'm not able to pull it up right now, so give me just a minute, let me see if I can for you. All right. There you are. Jeff, I made you co-host. Yeah, okay. Thank you. It is all set. Thank so you. So those, those are the rates for the upcoming year. And you'll see the historic rates at the bottom. Okay, so, I mean, they're relatively consistent. Mm -hmm. It's not an exact science. This isn't based solely on our cost per student. You know, we, right. we're basing it on our, on our cost per student plus any budgetary increases, but those budgetary increases don't reflect actual spend. It's not an exact science. It's, it's definitely approximate. But these would be the set rates if you vote them um, as per my memorandum dated um, June 9th, 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's do a motion and then we can discuss if there are any other questions. Um, can I have a motion to approve the tuition rates as presented for 2020-2021 school year? So moved. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments for Mr. Dowd or anything else? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Melissa, will you please call a roll vote? Roll call vote. Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yasenka? Yes. Motion carries? Okay, great, thank you. All right, Mr. Dowd, you are still up. We are talking about the fund balance retention. Yes, so when we talk about fund balance retention, I think it's always helpful to have a view as to where we are um, in the current year and, and um, what that means. So let's take a quick look at, and I'll share my screen again. Let's take a quick look at what our current um, situation looks, at, looks like. It's so a mid-year projection for 2019-20. I believe you had a copy of this at last at your last board meeting as well. Um, not much has really changed on it. We may have some additional pickups as we get closer to year end. You heard from um, Mrs. Gallagher relative to the potential for having some of the tuition costs absorbed by our um, the federal grant, the IDEA grant. Um, th that number has not been included in here because I'm not sure how Pinkerton is going to be reflected on their building. So we, we still could have another $60,000 um, out there. So these are based on estimates. I think generally we're looking at about a, a favorable variance of $355,000 for salaries. Um, dental, health, we're looking at about $45,000. Other benefits, $150,000. Regular education tuition, $200,000. Special education tuition, $60,000. Utilities, $30,000. Regular education transportation, 80,000. Special education transportation, 75,000. We'll also have to make a contribution to our food service fund, um, which would be an unfair favorable variance of 80,000 because the food service fund obviously had not been operating and generating revenue during that time. Um, we have other favorable variances, miscellaneous variances of about 30,000. So 
We're looking at an appropriations variance of about 945,000. We have a revenue variance anticipated of about 244,000 um, coming in, which includes some favorable Medicaid um, reimbursements that I had not um, believed would be coming in when we budgeted the revenue. So the projected surplus, surplus before the capital reserve contribution is 1,189,000. You'll recall that this year's capital reserve contribution on the warrant was 400,000. So that, that I've removed that before you uh, come up with your projected spendable surplus. Your current fund balance retained is 450,000. That 789,000 does not include that 450,000. So the fund balance retained really is what the purpose of, the, um, of this agenda item is. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you have relative to the mid-year projection and then we can move on to the fund balance retained. Any questions? No? Okay. I have um, sent to you on uh, your email a, um, a copy of that schedule which you received at the last meeting, but also just a brief introduction as to what, or a brief refresher for what the retained fund balance is. And that is an amount of the unassigned fund balance retained by the school district to satisfy emergency expenditures pursuant to any uh, Hampshire RSA 3211. And that can be up to two and a half percent of the total net, net assessment um, is permitted to be retained. Our district, based on our assessment, I think the maximum that we could retain is about 583,000. Uh, the relevant statutes are 198.4b, which establishes the right of the district to, to maintain that two and a half percent. And the question is, what does the money get used for? Well, it can get used for, as you see under RSA 3211, the emergency expenditures and overexpenditures. Money can be used when an unusual circumstance arises during the year, which makes it necessary to expend the money, expend money in excess of an appropriation, which may result in an overexpenditure over of the total amount appropriated. So this is amounts that's over the total amount of our entire budget um, for all purposes uh, when no appropriation has been made. There are a number of different procedural aspects. If we wanted to spend the money, we would need to make application to um, uh, the Commissioner of Education, and there's a whole process and procedure to do that. I've truncated the RSA, but the de there are a few more details and procedural requirements. We've never had to dip into the fund balance retained and situations that districts have that other districts have had to dip into it involve, um, for example, if you have um, and I don't think COVID is a great example, but if you have a, a, a school that has perhaps a roof collapse or some calamity occur um, because of snow, um, by way of example, um, you may be reimbursed from uh, the risk management company, but in the meantime, you need to relocate all of your students and teachers and set up your school somewhere else. That might be something that for some districts would put them over the edge. So it's really a very odd, it would be a very um, odd series of events that would come up typically that would require um, using using that um, uh, fund balance retained that amount that you, we retain for fund balance. So, in this case, it's at four hundred and fifty thousand. If you keep it where it is, it would stay at four hundred and fifty thousand. Um, that is simply money that uh, that the district holds on to that does not go back to taxpayers that um, would in fact be able to be used if we needed it, if our expenditures exceeded our appropriations, and we made application to the Department of Ed um, relating to that expenditure. So, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Sure. Um, so this is just helping me understand all this. Mm -hmm. The seven hundred, the seven hundred and eighty-nine. I know that's after taking out the capital reserve. Yep. Where does just because I'm thinking now of capitals or where does the I think it's one hundred and twenty-five or one hundred and fifty thousand that initially goes back to the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Um. Where does that fall in here? It's included, I would imagine, right? right. Okay. Right. Which is yeah. which also helps us get to this 450, which is what, which is our number we could retain. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I. So you know, you you mentioned everything with COVID going on as well. So this. I feel like this pertains to it. Is there is there an idea that we may very well end up with some expenses that are not that we wouldn't have accounted for 
in this upcoming budget year because obviously this was an, an unprecedented event for us. Now, I imagine we also have what some may say are savings where maybe we're not running certain things at the schools, but um, is that anything we should take into consideration here as far as if we needed to um, be prepared for these other unexpected expenses or if you feel like that that part of it shouldn't be a consideration because we have enough to move from different funds if we needed to. I think that you are in a, in a slightly different situation than you've been in the past and with knowing that the the COVID situation is out there no plans have been set in stone with respect to reopening the schools or buildings or transportation or or um, having our students back. However, um, under certain scenarios that I've seen, there have been additional expenses beyond purchasing Chromebooks and those expenses that we've incurred this year. That's a factor. Would that push us over our budget? I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I think that it's a slight risk factor. We just don't know. Um, but it's, it's a factor that we probably wouldn't have considered or had on the radar, let's say, last year. So it's a slightly different scenario this year, I guess, upcoming. Um, mm -hmm. than it had been in years past, just because we do have this odd situation, not odd situation, but the situation that we just don't really know what 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 the end game is going to be, what the costs are going to be. Right. Right. I believe Karen. Um, sorry. Did Karen Gallagher, does she have her hand up? I don't know. I can't see everyone. Yeah, I think she may just be playing with the features. Oh, see that? Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Maybe she wants to speak. Mike, could you unmute, Karen? Yep, one second. When Karen speaks in this environment, we listen. We always listen to Karen. Always. Then Karen has to unmute, I think, on her end as well. Yeah, okay. I've clicked the button. Thanks. All right. All right, so um, in listening to the conversation, the only thing I want to put out there is comp ed services. Um, that might be something, well, certainly something that was unexpected and it can get costly. You know, I'm thinking of um, outside services. Okay. Compensatory services? Yes. Yep. You know, just as an example, physical therapy could not be provided during the school closure. Okay. Um, so there are a few students, you know, that are going to require those services to be made up. Yeah, I think it's just an example of, of the of a really a broad range of compensatory services. Exactly. Yeah, there'll be other types of services, but um, certainly something we didn't budget for or plan. Or anticipate. Right. So, Caitlin, if I could. Yes. Yeah, so in, in reviewing, uh, you know, our neighboring states, so Massachusetts put out uh, quite a lengthy list of things you're going to need to do in the event that schools reopened. And, um, you know, I, when I'm reading that, I'm, I'm thinking like you're thinking, all right, what are the costs associated with some of these requirements? So I, I think, you know, we're waiting for our task force, you know, in New Hampshire to, to come up with the guidelines and then we're going to need to do our own kind of local thing about what, what does it look like and what makes sense for Hampstead. And part of that will be what are the expenses associated with, what the new normal is going to look like. And mm -hmm. just being honest, it's hard to plan for something that you don't know. But there are certain scenarios that we can kind of get some estimates, if you will, but I, I think right now we don't know. But I, we do have a healthy budget. Um, you know, we're resource rich. I, I think we'll, we'll be able to do what we need to do, uh, but there are gonna be some considerations and we'll work that out uh, with the board, I think, um, moving forward. But I think, it's a little early right now, primarily because we don't know what those guidelines are going to look like. We suspect, we think we know what they're going to look like, but we're not 100% sure what, what they look like. And that will drive what the cost of things for sure, right? what resources we need. So okay. that's a, that's, thank you for bringing that up as a consideration. But uh, we're certainly looking at you know what you have for surplus and certainly what, what next year's budget looks like and what kind of things we, we might need to move around to make things work. But I think we'll be fine. Okay. Jeff, can you refresh my memory? Do we typically just retain the max amount we can? No. Uh, no. Okay. No, I think I think we um in, we I think we were at four hundred fifty thousand last year, 
and um, the, it almost needs to be reset every year. So I think a motion, if you were to opt to maintain it at the $450,000 level, uh, the motion would read something like to, to set fund balance retention for the fiscal year end of June 30th, 2020 at 450,000. Okay, Caitlin, I yeah. just want to throw in the mix. I've never really, um, I've never really understood why the board's been reluctant to take the max that we're allowed to under law. I mean, that's that's a cushion that we have that we can use. If it's not expended, it goes back. But especially this year, when we're dealing with so many unknowns with COVID, um, I mean, I'd like to put forth that we take the max that we can this year. If we don't use it, great, but. I would feel more comfortable knowing that it's there and there's no reason legally for us not to take it. So that's, yeah. that's, that's my two cents. I would, I would tend to agree with that, especially, you know, Dr. Metzler, you referenced what Massachusetts has put out. Um, and if we were to come anything close to that, if we were to try at all to actually open schools and physically be in the buildings between protective gear and I would imagine there might need to be additional staff hired to make a lot of um, any similar guideline work. Um, I, I would tend to agree with Karen that we would, we should retain the full amount. I don't know what other board members are, what your thoughts are, but. That makes sense. I completely agree. There, uh, there, Caitlin, if I could, there, you know, there, there, the, op the reopening of school, there's almost a hundred percent chance that there'll be duplication of services, which will increase costs. The, the, I, I can't see any other way um, to do what I think they're going to ask us to do at some point. So um, you're right. You're right. It is a nice savings and certainly it goes back if you don't spend it. And we also have reimbursables. So we, we don't know that formula. Um, Jeff probably has a better idea, but you know, we don't know for sure until we have that money in our hands. So it, this, is a, this is a nice um, security blanket, if you will, for, for the town and certainly for our families. So uh, I agree. Okay. I'd like to make a motion, Caitlin, that, that we set the fund balance retention at, Jeff, I'm gonna need the numbers, at the maximum allowed, the 2.5% of the fiscal year's net assessment. I believe you said that amount is around 583,000, 583? Correct, yep. Okay. 583,509 dollars. Okay, that's my motion. Second. Okay, um, if there's no other discussion or questions at this point, uh, Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, um, yes. I would ask, could you reread the motion um, and I'll tell you why in a moment, if you wouldn't mind restating the motion. Melissa, do you have the motion? Melissa or me? Whoever has the motion. Do you have the motion, Melissa? Yes. Um, the motion is to set the fund balance retention at the maximum of 2.5% of this year's net assessment at $583,000. Does that sound right? That sounds fine. I would I would um, ask if if a, perhaps a friendly amendment be made to um, in, in insert um, estimated at five hundred eighty three thousand five hundred nine. So just insert the word estimated. The motion is going to be for the maximum two and a half percent. If the DRA uh, Department of Revenue Administration and I should have a, a a difference on what that actual dollar amount is, I don't want the motion to fail. You're going for the maximum two and a half percent period. Um, and it's estimated at, at 583509 So that'll preserve the intent of the motion. Okay. Karen, are you? I understand that as Karen. Uh, I'll amend the motion to read the way Jeff just um, explained it. That's fine. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Who seconded? Mr. Smith? You good with second with the amendment? Right. Yeah. Okay, just checking. All right, Melissa, you can call the roll vote. Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. 
Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Rusenka? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is a SAU 55 withdrawal planning update. I don't have much to update. Um, David and I will be participating in mediation uh, this Thursday, the 11th. We have been planning and gathering information so that we are ready to go into mediation and work with our attorney to get the best possible outcome for everyone. That's about it. <laughs> um, last item under current business is policies under second read. We have two policies for second read this week. They are EIB and JLCEA. So if you need a refresher, take a moment to look at what we moved forward at our last meeting for first read. And when you're ready, um, I'll take a motion for those. Motion to accept uh, the two policies. Okay. Second. Okay. Okay. Any discussion or questions on those? Seeing, hearing none. Melissa, will you please take a roll vote? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Jasenka? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for current business. Um, board comments and correspondence. I'll go in order that I see. Uh, David, do you have anything? Uh, no, nothing. Uh, Mr. Sweeney. Um, just much thanks to all from Central and Middle School and town and SAU for, um, for all the graduations and all the presentations and car parades, uh, everything uh, this past week or so. Has been fantastic. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, um, Megan. Um, no, I don't have anything tonight. Okay, uh, Karen. Oh, just wishing everyone a healthy and safe summer. Thank you. Uh, I do not have anything else. I will echo the other sentiments of thank yous and hoping that everyone has a good summer. Uh, so next up would be consent agenda. Dr. Metzler, not sure if we have a personnel report, but your superintendent. Thank you, Caitlin. No, we, uh, there is no personnel report tonight. Uh, I have a pretty brief um, superintendent's report. You know, first, I'd like to thank the town uh, for uh, organizing uh, a parade for our, the class of 2020 for our Hampstead seniors. You know, they leave Hampstead to go to Derry for high school, most of them. Um, but it wasn't just Pinkerton, it was any, any graduating senior. So I want to thank the, the town that was, I know that went, uh, went off well on Sunday. Certainly want to thank Pinkerton Academy for everything they're doing for us. And certainly want to thank um, Principal Danola and her staff and uh, Principal Collins and his staff. We've asked them to do an awful lot and they've, they've answered the bell and done an outstanding job. Uh, support staff letters of agreement. Uh, we need to have those out by June 17th. So this is an update for the support staff. Those letters of agreement, they're being handled electronically this year as many of you are aware. Uh, SAU developed a procedure similar to the one developed and implemented in May for the professional staff. Uh, whereas we'd like to get to provide these documents in short order, it takes time to ensure the process is done correctly. You know, managing a business office remotely um, has its challenges. I know we can send things back and forth electronically, but um, it you know, really does not replace that face-to-face -face interaction that you have between offices in a building. And it, it's, made it, it's made it challenging, even though we can do things electronically. Our deadline is June 17th. Uh, we, we hope that we're going to get those letters out uh, even earlier than that. I know they're working on it. So support staff, they're coming. Um, and uh, thank you for your patience. 
Uh, Hempstead School Board Scholarship Winners Update. Last meeting, I reported that we were informed by Pinkerton of this delay this year with their awards committee shifting to a remote selection process to review applicants. Uh, they have chosen two seniors uh, for your scholarship. I do not know who they are, uh, but they said they will have these winners presented at your June 23rd meeting. Uh, and that's all I have for uh, superintendent's report. And also you have a review of approval of financial documents. Um, so one motion to accept the consent agenda will do it and we'll be good. Okay. Thank you. Any I, questions? Oh yeah. Any questions before we go to a motion? Nope. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? Hello. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yosenka? Yes. Okay. Motion carries to accept the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, I only have one item that I wanted to mention since Dr. Metzler just mentioned our meeting on the 23rd. I know um, in the past, we have, at least this last several years, have not held that meeting. It was after school was out. We were pretty much done with everything going on, both with the withdrawal and should any updates happen regarding the COVID updates and what school looks like last year. Um, I am, I am going to keep that meeting um, on the 23rd. I think there is um, a high likelihood we're going to have things to discuss. And um, while I'm hoping we don't have to meet over the summer, um, I think we all need to be aware that there is a chance that we may need to do something. Um, again, could be withdrawal related, could be um, COVID related as we try to figure out what school looks like in the fall. Um, I know that our educators and our administrators are working on about three to four different plans. Um, to be ready for the fall and be, hopefully be able to meet whatever they are being asked to do. So um, I just want to update the board on that, that I, I, I think we should be prepared for um, whatever we need to do. Caitlin, if I could. Yes. Yeah, so no, that uh, it makes perfect sense. I mean, we, we need to, we have some pressing issues that we have to take care of anyway on June 23rd. You know, we may need to meet in July at some point, but I think we also should consider work sessions. Uh, I think it would be an opportunity for us to do non-meeting kind of work sessions to get get things done, put product together, and then and then perhaps be able to release that information publicly. So, you know, we're prepared to do a you know a number of different ways to get the work done. Outcome really is to have a really solid plan that you know the board supports and the town supports uh, for the reopening of schools, whatever that's going to look like. So um, we're working on that, and I think. Um, yeah, well, I'll be asking you perhaps for a work session or two, um, maybe uh, at some point in the near future. But uh, those are probably July dates, I think. So, okay. all right. So we, I mean, there really isn't, we can't really do anything yet. So we just have to wait and see what uh, the recommendations are from the task force at the, uh, out of Concord. And then we'll have our own task force to take care of a Hampstead business. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I, I do intend, um, I think as a board, as we not looking at COVID, but looking at everything else on our plates, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be looking to bring stuff to the town for a finalized um, or a more finalized plan for what our single district SAU is going to look like. Um, so that's something we hope to be able to bring forward to. Um, there's some discussions about how we can get be best get feedback, um, especially in a, in an electronic virtual meeting space um but uh, you know we do intend to do that so once we have a more finalized plan so um i think that is it i do not see any need for a non-public tonight um unless anybody has any issues that they feel need to be discussed and if not I am going to say we are adjourned as of 846. Thank you, Caitlin. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.
Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa.